All right, I'm here today to talk about the role of irrationality in sexism. And the reason that I chose that title was that I originally agreed to do this speech kind of to talk about religion and sexism. But then I kind of thought that was a little too narrow because it, get, it lets a lot of people that consider themselves probably irreligious or even atheistic off the hook. So this is going to be a two-part speech um, where I talk about religion and sexism and religion or in sexism and pseudoscience or bad science or whatever kind of whatever word you want to use. Sometimes it actually gets called and funded as science, but it, I don't know if you really want to even imbue that idea to it. So um, I thought I'd start off with talking about religion. Um, but before I get into that, I want to talk about like the idea of rationalization, because I think that's the thing that holds all of what I'm going to talk about today together. Rationalization is sort of a psychological concept where people, the idea behind it is that people decide what they're going to believe and then intellectualize it. And we all do this. Like this isn't something, we use the word kind of just badly in most of the common use of it as if to say somebody believes something that's wrong or false and then they just kind of rationalize it. But you also rationalize correct decisions. You, you rationalize everything. Almost all decisions are made emotionally and then in, uh, intellectualized after the fact. And rationalization is also a matter of kind of overcoming cognitive dissonance. So it really kicks into effect when you have a choice between two decisions or three or four and you don't, each one has value to you, but you have to pick one, so you'll pick it, and then after that, you'll just sort of rationalize your decision. Say you bought a MacBook instead of a PC, then after you buy the MacBook, and you, like when you're making the decision, you'll be like, well, Macs are good, but PCs are good, blah, da, da. And then after you buy the Mac, you're like suddenly the Mac person. <laughs> You're like, I am all about Macs, PCs suck. So that's kind of how rationalization works. And the reason that rationalization is really important to talk about in the context of sexism is <laughs> that sexism is something that people believe on an emotional level. They believe that women are inferior, or they believe that they have special roles, or they believe that they're different than men in some fundamental way that they probably aren't. We probably aren't. <laughs> um, and subsequently, but people want to believe it. They want to believe this about women. So what they do is they make the emotional decision to believe X, Y, or Z about women. And then they seek things in the world that tell them that their feelings about it are right. And religion, that's what it does in the world for a lot of people. Like most of the world religions are intensely patriarchal, mostly because most societies are intensely patriarchal and so basically religion is there to say God did it. Um, and religion is really ideal for this because as I said here, religion is made up. Um, people just said whatever they felt like sounded good and therefore you can kind of manipulate it into the end of time. Like you can find, I'm sure as you all know, whatever you want in the Bible to justify whatever you want. You can do that to the end of time. And I do think that a lot of atheists get into this sort of habit of thinking, they go to the text first, and they say, this is why this is wrong, etc. And they don't think about how most religious people believe about whatever the, the hell they believe, which is that they believe what they want to, and then they find the justification for it in the Bible. So the Bible itself, the Quran itself, all those things are almost irrelevant, except that they are there to be a tool to be used to rationalize what you already believe. Um, religion also is useful for defending sexism because it squelches discussion. <laughs> Um, and I put this up here. This is a story that I just read a few days ago. I put this, po this PowerPoint together earlier this week, so most of this stuff is really new. Um, there was a scandal at Dartmouth University a, a couple weeks ago as an example of how religion squelches discussion, where a Dartmouth senior hopped up on kind of newbie feminism, <laughs> decided that she was going to pass mirrors out to all the female students that she encountered at Dartmouth, and in, in request that they 
spend some time investigating their lady bits in the bathroom. <laughs> um, <clears throat> It's a very 1970s style feminist exercise, and it, I mean it has a lot of value to it. But um, you know, you can imagine some of the, the the students' reaction to having somebody like give you a smear and ask you to do this. Like some some people were not happy with this, but you know, it's a university. It's a place where you're supposed to have sort of free and open dialogue about these sort of issues. So. Most people just sort of, if they didn't like it, rolled their eyes and moved on. Except this one student, Grace D'Arcy, who wrote in the Dartmouth newspaper saying that this was offensive and she used religion as the rationalization for that. This offends people of faith. Why vaginas offend people of faith? Well, I mean, that's exactly the point, isn't it? I mean, the vagina, uh, like the idea of looking at yourself, the idea of female sexuality offended this woman and, and being open and discussing it, but she couldn't actually make a rational, logic-based argument against it. You know, there's nothing inherently wrong with doing that. There's nothing you could actually say like, that's wrong. So instead, she says, that's offensive. That, we're, putting, we're using religion to say, we're just not even going to talk about that. And um, if you even discuss it, you're offending my religious faith. And so that is what religion is very, very good at doing. And that is why sexists love it. <laughs> because, because sexism is irrational. Like, make no mistake. Like, it's very hard to construct rational arguments for whatever things that people want to say about women. So a lot of religious people, a lot of fundamentalist Christians say that women are different than men, women are more nurturing, women shouldn't be in the world, women should be at home having babies. That's their natural state. Well, the evidence against that is women like me, we don't want to, so there. <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, just simply pointing to the evidence in the world, it, 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 it's a tough thing, so instead you squelch discussion. Now, having gone into sort of that, I want to talk a little bit about Islam, and this is something that came up last time I spoke to a group of skeptics in the Boston, skeptics in the pub. Somebody asked me about this, and it was regarding something called boob quake, which was kind of funny. I, I'll definitely give you that. They were asking, like, w did you think that that was an appropriate atheist activism? And I didn't want to say that it wasn't. I just wanted to make a word of caution that Westerners living in a fundamentally, like a mostly Christian society should kind of think very carefully about how easy it is to target Muslims and what that can be used for in our society. You know, uh, there's a, a lot of Christians that would like to forward the argument that Islam is fundamentally wor evil, that it is fundamentally worse than Christianity, that it is very sexist and, raw and evil to women, and my argument is that Religion is basically a blank slate. It tells you whatever you want it to tell you. Islam is no worse or better than Christianity. It is just as much a blank slate. The Quran is no more worse or better than the Bible. Blank slate. A lot of Muslim societies are very sexist. So is our society. But I, do, I want to caution you to, when you're thinking about talking about Islam to kind of think about it in terms of it's just like Christianity. It's no more, no less. It is not what's in the books. It's what people want to believe and then bring to the books. Um, and so when we're trying to think of atheist activist things to target sexism especially, I think sometimes it's wiser to choose our own society as an example because that hits people where, the, where they live. That actually makes people think. It's very hard for Westerners that grew up in a Christian society to, to see arguments about Islam as anything other than those people are wrong, as opposed to religion itself is wrong, sexism itself is wrong. So I just wanted to say that's why I use primarily Christian examples when I'm doing these kind of discussions. You guys got really quiet. Was that very forbidden? <laughs> All right. Now, this is conservative Christians on gender are, are kind of an interesting, you know, obviously not all Christians <laughs> agree that, that sexism is right, um, and that's because religion is a blank slate. You can believe whatever the hell you want to believe. 
it's evidence free. Um, but there is a lot of Christians in our society that I would consider conservative Christians. They are uh, mostly Catholic or evangelical Christians. And they, their response to, set, to feminism has been very interesting. They're against it, make no mistake. Um, but they also feel it at home when you say, like, I, I don't think that your teachings that women in, are inferior are right. Like, they don't like to hear that they've always taught that women are inferior to men, but they have. And so what they've come up with is this kind of revised anti-feminism, this revised sexism, and they call it complementarianism. And it's the idea that the genders are equal, they're just different. Which in, you know, it's the separate but equal argument. <laughs> you know, but just applied to gender. And, and they say this even while touting this particular Bible verse that says, wives, submit to your, yourselves unto your husbands as unto the Lord, which is the doctrine of female submission, which is the idea that women were basically put, as this book shows, on earth to serve men. That they are here to have men's babies, they are here to wipe men's brows, they are here to clean up after men. And, and we're told by conservative Christians that this should be treated like an honor, <laughs> that, that God gave you a role and you should be happy to live, live in it. And um, clearly all that is is just an extremely elaborate rationalization for what they want. And it, it is an interesting thing. I, I don't know if you guys saw the New York Times Magazine, um, like the last issue. They had a really great article called How's, How's Wives for God. And it was about how there are a lot of women in the sort of conservative Christian community who are sort of exploiting this idea of wifely submission to kind of create careers and lives for themselves outside of the home. <laughs> um, basically, they, they, they become preachers who teach other women about this sort of like, you should submit to your husband, what he says goes, you should always get permission to do anything. Um, you should basically live to like help him and they make money doing this and they get to do public speaking like I'm doing doing this and they get to get out of the house and they even get their husbands to do the dishes while doing this so it's kind of interesting but this is kind of what they teach fundamentally they teach that God doesn't like it when women talk back to their husbands they wouldn't say it like that they would say if you are arguing with your husband or if you disagree, you know, you should sort of quietly and as submissively as possible <laughs> make your suggestions and then understand at the end of the day if he just disagrees with you, his word goes. They don't like them to work outside of the home, especially if, if they have small children at home. Excuse me, I have a cold. Um, but this is something that's kind of being revised rapidly as they're beginning to realize the political value of having women up at, at front as leaders of the conservative movement. So like somebody like Sarah Palin or Sharon Engel can be out there as a conservative Christian preaching this sort of like complementarianism, but they also are politicians who are running for office, but it's okay because they're doing it under the correct banner. Again, religion infinitely malleable. <laughs> Have premarital sex, this is the big one. <laughs> And definitely not seek abortion. And I would also say that, before I get into this, the, the conservative Christian movement right now, the Christian right, focuses mostly on abortion. <laughs> yeah, I said it, abortion. <laughs> but they're against, <laughs> they're against reproductive rights in general, and make no mistake about this. Like, if you actually kind of get into the weeds of it, they're also trying to push the idea that the birth control pill is an abortion inducer. And even though it's not, it actually works um, by suppressing ovulation. And they promote abstinence only in high schools, which is basically anti-contraception propaganda. Like, they're against reproductive rights, and I think that the main reason that they are is that reproductive rights, more than almost anything else in our society, has allowed women to live in public, in the public sphere and have lives. <laughs> 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 
I mean, well, Gloria Felt, who used to be the president of Planned Parenthood, like she took this very seriously, so seriously in her latest book, she said, of the number of the five main things she said women had to do to seek power in the real world, she was like a womb of your own. <laughs> Like, you, sh you, you, cannot, you cannot be working in the world if you're just constantly pregnant. Thus, the Christian right would prefer you to be constantly pregnant. I often attack abortion rights from the notion that pro-choice is the rational position. I'm not really a touchy-feely kind of person, in case that's not obvious. Um, and I think that if you look at the history of abortion rights and birth control rights in this country, you can definitely see that. Like, the old laws banning birth control and abortion were basically one law. And the rationale for them was they called them morality laws. Like they were under the same banner as sodomy laws and any other kind, like laws against drinking or anything else. And, you know, once birth control was overturned, like the bans on birth control were overturned in 1963 or 64 by the Supreme Court, it was just basically inevitable that Roe versus Wade was going to happen because that was how the laws were rationalized in the first place. Now, as soon as, soon as Griswold versus Connecticut, which was the, the Supreme Court decision that legalized reproductive rights went through, the Christian right, like I think, and particularly the Catholic Church realized that this was very inevitable and so they started to really scramble to make the arguments about fetal life and that a fetus is a person that has equal and, in fact, greater rights than the woman who is pregnant. And I don't really particularly think that's a very logical argument. I think that, it, I think that Roe versus Wade took that argument very seriously, and I think they came to exactly the proper conclusion, which is you can't argue that somebody is a person with equal or greater rights to another when they don't even have a brain. <laughs> And, and, I, and I, I know that that sounds callous, and I'm st I think that Roe had it correct, which is the more developed the fetus is, the more moral value it has. So, you know, I don't know very many or any pro-choicers who would say that you should be getting an abortion in the second trimester or third trimester on a lark when it actually, you know, is developed in a nervous system and even towards the end might even be feeling and hearing things. No, but nobody likes that. And the vast majority of those abortions are performed for medical reasons only. The vast, the vast majority of overall abortions are performed in the first eight weeks and then up to 12. So all before there's a brain. I think the rational position is if it doesn't have a brain, it certainly doesn't have equal rights to human women whose lives are often ruined by unplanned pregnancies. Or who, as my third point says, will do anything to not be pregnant so that their lives aren't ruined, including throw themselves downstairs. You, you know all the arguments. Get coat hanger abortions. If you value women's lives, I think that this is the only, the, the only rational position. And I think it's also incredibly important to understand that while there are a very handful of atheists and rationalists, people that oppose abortion rights, the vast majority, particularly of the activist community of, against reproductive rights is Christian in this country. Even other religions around the world tend to take a lighter view of abortion than the Christian right in the United States. It's basically the Catholic Church and evangelical Christians in almost the entire world. And this is true in any country that has strict abortion bans. They're usually Catholic or evangelical Christian community, uh, countries. And in fact, Michelle Goldberg, who wrote a really wonderful book about reproductive rights, told me after researching in South America about, like, they're, in a lot of South American countries, they're just making the laws stricter and stricter, and it's creating more and more problems with coat hanger abortions and, and other hellish things. She basically said that evangelical Christianity has sort of gotten a, strong, a foothold in many of these countries, and so the Catholic Church to compete with the evangelical church is becoming even more hardcore anti-choice in those countries to sort of, it's become this sort of ra like this, this race to see who can be the hardest on women who require abortions or even birth control. Um, so Frank Schaefer, I have this quote up here. Frank Schaefer is a really interesting guy. He is a uh, former anti-abortion activist, a former organizer for the Christian right who came to see the light. He's still a liberal Christian, but 
he's really turned like hardcore on the Christian right. And he's, his opinion is of the top three things that, is, that are between the top, his, he's listed three things that have mobilized the Christian right more than anything. And they're Christian reconstructionism, um, I forget the second one, sorry, and Roe versus Wade, basically. Like, they, the Christian right was kind of only, was initially organized in the 60s to oppose desegregation. But when they realized that that was rapidly becoming unpopular uh, as a view, they decided to switch to abortion rights. And that has more than anything been an organizing force for them. And it has created this alliance between Catholics and Protestants. This picture I have here is from the American Life League. I just put it up as evidence that they're not just against abortion. <laughs> they organize against the birth control pill. Every year on the anniversary of Griswold versus Connecticut, they have a rally against the birth control pill. It's legalization. Women's rights matter. They matter beyond just, I mean, they matter just because women need them and we're half the population, but they also matter in, in all sorts of ways. I think a lot of our mainstream media thinks that women's rights are a second tier issue, but in fact they swing elections. And this is an extremely good example. Joe Sestak and um, Pat Toomey were the, Repo Sestak was the Democrat and Toomey was in the race for the Pennsylvania Senate seat. And it was a squeaker of a race, as you can see. Sestak took all the urban areas, Toomey took all the rural areas. And most political anal analysts think that abortion was the reason that Toomey was able to squeak that out. Just the single issue voters on abortion alone were able to get him there. Frank, Sch Frank Schaefer, I thought I would end this discussion about kind of religion and how important women, like opposing women's rights are to religion and its power in our country with Frank Schaefer. The Reconstructionist worldview is ultra-Calvinist, and he, what he's talking about with the Reconstructionist worldview is this extremely tiny, tiny fundamentalist Christian sect of people. They call them uh, premillennialists or postmillennialists. Um, and postmillennialists believe that we are living in the kingdom of God, and that we need to create a thousand years of the kingdom of God, a, the a fundamental theocracy. Uh, for Jesus to return. They're an extremely small minority of evan evangelical Christians. Most evangelical Christians are premillennialists. Pre they believe that Jesus will come and that will bring in the thousand years of the kingdom of God. That said, Reconstructionists probably have more influence on the political views of the Christian right than any other group in this country. They're the ones who believe in theocracy. They're the ones that believe that government and religion should be one. They're the ones that have created political arguments that have been seized by the premillennialists and used as an organizing platform. So when he says the Reconstructionist worldview, he's actually talking about the political, if not theological, worldview of evangelical Christianity, period, in this country. The Reconstructionist worldview is ultra-Calvinist, but like all Calvinism, it has its origins in ancient Israel and Palestine. When vengeful and ignorant tribal lore was written down by frightened men, the nastier authors of the Bible, trying to defend their prerogatives to bully women, murder rival tribes, and steal land. And I pulled this quote out of a recent alternate article he wrote because I thought that he nailed it. This is what religion is for. It is to defend what you already believe. So... That's my religion portion of this. <laughs> but I felt like sometimes, <laughs> I thought y'all would like that cartoon. <laughs> I, I felt like sometimes it's easy to focus on religion as skeptics, atheists, and pro-rationalists. And I think that a lot of people in our have come around to the idea that religion is just fundamentally silly. I mean, Noah's Ark, Jesus rising from the grave. But they still have this desire to believe that women are inferior to men. And that has ushered in a new era of pseudoscience to kind of rationalize this. It claims to be real science. This is what is very confusing about it, and I think that this is something that I, I, I would like to see skeptics 
focus more on. Because the kind of underlying argument of it, though it's very rarely made directly, is that there is no such thing as a patriarchy, and a patriarchy is kind of the term for a male-dominated society that is built around like father dominance of families, so our society. <laughs> um, and they, they basically are trying to argue that there's no patriarchy, that men and women act the way they do, not because of social roles or, or prescribed rules or even laws, but because that's just what we want, that it's perfectly natural and instinctual. And they argue that unequal outcomes reflect unequal abilities. This has been a part of science. This has been the bastard child of science ever since evolutionary theory was discovered. Because ever since it was discovered, and it was basically, from, from Charles Darwin on, they realized evolutionary theory. And I'm not criticizing evolutionary theory. I'm yay evolutionary theory and, uh, all the way. But ever since Charles Darwin wrote The Origin of the Species, even he knew, as you all I'm sure know, that this was going to topple religion as a rationalization, as the fundamental like, understanding of who we are as human beings. And so I think that that, it, in a way, it has come, it, evolutionary theory, bad use of evolutionary theory, has been used to justify all sorts of sexism since the 19th century. Thus the incredible moving goalposts. In the 19th century, evolutionary biologists, would-be evolutionary biologists that were trying to argue that women were inferior to men not because of God but because of science, um, made some really ridiculous arguments. <laughs> they argued that women couldn't go to medical school because our uteruses take too much blood away from our brains. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> then there was skull measuring, which was also used <laughs> To, to argue that non-white non people were less intelligent and more criminal. Um, they would try to measure people's skulls and argue that people... It, it, it's, it sounds ridiculous now, but at the time it was the height of science. We're going to measure your skulls, and whoever's bigger ones is smarter. <laughs> well, of course women have smaller skulls on average. We're smaller. But they actually, that, that theory got thrown out when they began to realize that there are some really, really brilliant men that are also very slight of build. <laughs> and then I think in the 20th century you had more, like when hormones were discovered, you started to see more theories about how women's hormones are why they're inferior. So um, the notion that we're mercurial, that we can't be trusted, is all due to supposed fluctuations of our hormones due to menstruation. Never mind. And you actually start to, you still see those arguments around. Those are still somewhat floating around. For instance, a doctor who I think got stripped of his medical license that was appointed by the Bush administration um, to the FDA was known for doing a PowerPoint where he would argue that women who have sex with multiple partners become numb and unable to fall in love because their oxytocin rushes of their brain after they orgasm, like, breaks their brain. <laughs> the Christian right believes that only women have oxytocin. It's, it's very sad. <laughs> um, <laughs> But as more and more scientific evidence has come out that women are not more emotional or not more, are not stupider at literature or science, biology or any other thing that we've been said that we were inferior at, it's really been narrowed down to engineering and math for the people that are actually making these arguments from the, from the world of like real science, not Bush appointees, but like ensconced in actual academia. And the reason is that as opportunities have opened up for women, they have proven that they are just as good as men. The one exception to that rule is math and engineering and physics and all those sort of hard sciences. Women often start off in the undergraduate level at equal numbers to men, but by the time they get to the PhD level, like there's almost no women. When they're actually teaching at universities, they're like completely on. There are very few research scientists in these areas that are female. So pseudoscientists are trying to find a way to say that women may not be inferior in any other way, but they're certainly inferior at math, right? That's why. That's why. It couldn't possibly be sexism. 
And you see other kind of arguments about like why women are, are, are less equitable in certain fields, like w why women are more likely to stay home when they have children, um, is that a lot of people try to argue that they're genetically inclined to nurture more as opposed to the fact that our society just makes it really hard to have a baby and a full-time job for women. Um, I do find it really funny that these arguments always sort of point to the notion that men's inborn talents are stronger than women only in fields that pay way better, like engineering. <laughs> Whereas, you know, women can be English professors and go ahead and fight for those jobs. <laughs> All of these kind of things came to a head in the political sphere a few years ago when Larry Summers was still the um, president of Harvard. And as you can imagine, when somebody is the president of Harvard, you're actually under a lot of, you, you, uh, you get a lot of pressure to address these kind of problems, particularly from your female staff. Um, he made a speech defending the fact that women were not as well represented in, the, represented in the hard sciences that I'm sure you all are familiar with, but I thought I'd like re-hit a couple of the points that I thought were particularly ridiculous. He claimed that men are more likely to be, more likely to be outliers, which is men are more likely to have autism than women. Subsequently, this should mean that men are more likely to be mathematical geniuses. There, this is an argument that might, make, might have evidence for it one day. It isn't really now. But it also implies that everybody who's in the hard sciences in a university level is, a geni is genius level IQ, and I just really don't think that's likely. They just really love what they do, and women are perfectly capable of loving what they do. If, that's, if, if, if it's math. But he also made the most uh, strange claim, and I think he was just gra grasping at straws, that our gender differences are inborn, and he was going to the females or more nurturing than the males argument, saying that his, his twin daughters, who were like three at the time, had, he'd given them trucks, and they called them daddy trucks and baby trucks, and that means obviously women are more inclined to stay home and have babies instead of, you know, work um, at full-time jobs as math professors. I, <laughs> I found that really interesting because th you hear this argument so often from people, well, I looked at two, three, four, and five-year-olds, and they're already living out their gender roles. The girls love pink. The boys love trucks. And I find that really funny because it's like, they're arguing that we evolved that way, but how did we evolve the gene? Where on the XX chromosome is the gene for pink? You know, <laughs> where, where, how did men evolve to like trucks? Like they've only been around for a hundred years. I would think a better explanation is that his daughters at three years had had three solid years of learning gender roles. That's a long time. That's, that's a junior in college on gender roles. <laughs> The other side of the story, and I, I put this book up here because I think this is an extremely good book that you should all read by Cordelia Fine. It just came out. It's called Delusions of Gender. And she basically takes all these, these studies that show that women talk more, or men are better at math, or all these very, you know, even infants, girls look more at, women, at people's faces when you're talking to them. And she shows what the problems were. And the two main things that she points out is studies that show gender differences are far more likely to be amplified in the mainstream media than ones that don't. So if you do like 10 studies of infants and only one of them shows that you got a reaction, a gendered reaction to whatever the hell you were studying, that's the one that's gonna be published in the New York Times. The other nine won't. And she also showed that studies that show gender differences are often really poorly controlled. For instance, um, Simon Baron Cohen, um, Sasha Baron Cohen's father or uncle, actually, which always cracks me up. Because I like, huh? Cousin. They are related. I like one, I don't like the other so much. <laughs> um, did a study where they went to, to a hospital for newborns, because they were trying to show gender differences have to be inborn. So they were studying newborns. And they dangled like a toy in front of them, the newborn babies and studied how long the babies looked at your faces. And the girls looked at, 
people's faces longer. So this was supposed to be evidence that women are more empathetic. The problem was that the scientists didn't control, they didn't do a double blind study on it. They didn't blind themselves at all. They walked into the rooms where the mothers had the babies and they sat, had the babies sitting in the mother's laps with all the balloons and the congratulations on your new baby girl or boy, <laughs> like all over the rooms. So the, the, the people doing the study already knew, like the people actually doing it knew whether they were looking at a boy or a girl. And there's ways that you can even subconsciously change that. You can wiggle the toy a little harder. There, I mean, there's millions of ways. You can't do a, a study on these without blinding yourself to like what gender the person you're studying is as best you can, particularly with newborns, because you can't tell with a newborn whether it's a boy or a girl if it's wearing clothes, gender neutral clothes. <laughs> And another thing, she, she kind of spends a lot of time on the, like, women are bad at mass stereotypes and pointed out that, that girls in the United States certainly don't perform as well in math on the SATs and other things. But if you go to other countries, it's pretty much equitable. It, whether or not girls do well in math depends almost entirely on whether their culture has a stereotype of whether or not girls are bad at math. Um, stereotype threat is, the, is basically that. The notion, this notion behind the stereotype threat, which has been really well researched, is that if you introduce somebody to a stereotype of themselves before you test them on something, they're going to perform more poorly, particularly if the stereotype is that a person like them can't do that. So it's, it's, such, a very, it's such an exquisitely um, strong uh, influence that just asking somebody for their race or gender before taking the SATs, before taking the standardi standardized test, women and people of color will actually do worse on tests if you ask first instead of at, at the end of the test. Just, just being reminded of what their gender or race is. It's that bad. Um, and also, she found that there have been a lot of studies that show that women who do love math and choose the careers in it find that they have to choose between feeling female and feeling like a professor of their career or a scientist in their career. They feel like their male colleagues pressure them to, they, they focus on their femininity so much that they feel pressured to either leave or downplay the fact that they're female. So like when you're asked to choose between your gender, your fundamental self, and your career, you're <laughs> um, So I just wanted to put this up because this is another good book. This is a much older book than the last one I showed you. Um, but I really like this book because it's really funny. Um, and she also talks about the notion that she, she, she also addresses the idea that feminists are saying that men and women aren't different at all. We're not saying that. Like, clearly women can get pregnant and men can't. That's a big difference. Um, but, you know, certain things like the way our brains are structured are not as different as they're made out to be. So this is a really good book. Um, so this is where we come to evolutionary psychology. And I feel bad even using the term because I don't necessarily think that the idea behind evolutionary psychology is a bad one. I think that we are obviously an evolved species like all that is going to influence our choices, our behaviors, our society. I think that there is a way that it can be done. I just don't think that it's being done that way most of the time. Most of what you read is what they call the Flintstone fallacy, which is the notion that we can look at our very narrow specific society and the things that happen in it and then extrapolate from there what we evolved to be like. And so basically they call it the Flintstone fallacy because it's this notion that cavemen lived in these nuclear families <laughs> just, you know, with the wives at home with aprons just like we, we do. You know, it, it gets that ridiculous. Um, it, it does have a lot of wishful thinking. Like a long, for a long, long time in evolutionary psychology circles, the argument was that men are promiscuous and women are monogamous naturally. And that, that, that our behaviors, that men's more promiscuous behaviors were a result of, of evolution and not of so society telling them that they could more than women. <laughs> and now that women have more sexual freedom, they tend to sleep around more, so that's actually falling out of favor. <laughs> and I decided just to kind of show, like this, I figured this would be something to address just by going through a kind of case study and bullshit. <laughs> 
um, so that you guys can maybe like think about this and go forward into the world and criticize and be skeptical of more evolutionary psychology you read in the mainstream media. David Buss is one of my least favorite people that gets into the New York Times all the time that is not a government official or politician. <laughs> he, <laughs> he is a professor of psychology at the University of Texas of Austin and he often gets into the newspaper by doing these studies where he purports to show that men are callous, promiscuous, rapist bastards and women are, you know, overly emotional, monogamous, that, you know, all the stereotypes you can imagine. So just, just last, just like a week and a half ago in the New York Times, they ran this whole article and, and everything he says is that men and women are this way because of evolution. So. Just a couple weeks ago in the New York Times, they ran an article about a study he did where he showed 375 college men, he, he, at, he put them into two groups, a group where they were told that they were supposed to be looking for a partner for a one night stand, and a group that was told they were looking for their wife, basically, long term relationship. And then after they were told what they were supposed to be looking for, they were asked if they wanted to see a picture, Oh, they were they were given a picture of a woman where it was like completely concealed. They could either see her face or her body, but they couldn't see both because that's how it happens in nature. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the the results were predictable. The guys looking for a one night stand asked to see the body, and the guys looking for a wife asked to see the face. Like any one of us could have told you that was what was going to happen. And my feeling, well, this is basically what the New York Times said from this. To put it in clinical terms, facial features are cues of youth and health, and features like large eyes are feminine because they are sensitive to the rise in estrogen levels that accompanies puberty and persists through a woman's reproductive lifespan. That would indicate long-term reproductive value, that is, the time a woman has left to reproduce. So, like, your face somehow tells you that. As if... Which cracks me up because it, it is sort of implies that men that were in their 50s looking for women in their 50s to have one night stands or marry would be like, I don't care. I don't want to see anything, right? Because <laughs> <laughs> you can't reproduce at that age. <laughs> and then it continues. The body, meanwhile, signifies fertility in the here and now. A young and comely pregnant woman, for example, would have a high reproductive value but zero current fertility potential. She's clearly already taken. I think that that was a hat tip there. You don't know that a pregnant woman has a boyfriend. <laughs> Evolutionary psychology theory holds that men value current fertility more in short-term mate and reproductive value face in the long term. <laughs> I, I'm, I, I'm sort of, I, if you're looking for your wife, are you going to go for the pregnant woman? Guys? Okay, that's what I thought. <laughs> All right, here are my non-bullshit my non theories as to what this study actually measured. <laughs> that 19-year-old men have been socialized in gender roles for 19 years. That's, that's a long time. Like, that's a doctorate right there <laughs> uh, in gender roles. And that one of the things that they have learned is the Madonna horse syndrome. Like, that the woman you marry should be, you know, a good, more chaste woman, and that the woman you just sleep with should be a little bit more of a bad girl, right? And I think that that probably influenced whether they wanted to see the face or the body. But I also think it's just logic. I mean, <laughs> with a one-night stand, like, the percentage of the time you're going to be looking at somebody naked is, like, 95% of the time you spend with them. With somebody you marry, it's reverse. 95% of the time you aren't looking at them naked. You just have to see their face. So I think that, you know, when you ask somebody a logical question, they're going to give you a logical answer. It also didn't, like, studies like this don't actually take into account, like, they don't study the way people actually make decisions in real life. We don't decide if we're going to go with somebody by going, okay, see your face or see your body, you know? Um, Buss has never, he does these picture studies all the time, as far as I can tell, he has never created a correlation, a line of evidence showing a correlation between what people look for in a picture and what people look for in real life, like a strong correlation, like between what you find attractive in a picture and what you would might find attractive in real life. And I think that that alone kind of just kills a lot of his studies. If anybody's done online dating here, you, you've got to know that just because somebody's picture is attractive to you doesn't mean that you're going to find them hot.
hot in person. Um, he doesn't ever talk about personality or circumstances that influence choice, like whether or not somebody is looking for a wife or a long, like a one night stand probably depends on where they meet them, where they are in life. M many more things than just looking at a picture or being told that's what they're doing. And he has no inkling of understanding that a lot of the time people have one night stands and then fall in love. It happens all the time. I'm sure it's happened to some of you in this audience. <laughs> so, to, to kind of wind us all up, I thought that I like the site, What's the Harm? <laughs> and I thought I would talk about what's the harm of all these kind of religion and pseudoscience and all these other things promoting this sort of irrational rationalization for sexism. And I thought The Bachelor alone, <laughs> as a TV show, should tell us like what this, like these gender stereotypes do to us. Irrational sex, I mean this, this should be obvious but I thought it, you know, be a good conclusion. Irrational sexism hurts women. We have, we fa when people think we're naturally inclined not to seek opportunities, they just make fewer opportunities available to us. If you think that the woman you're going to hire is just going to like have a bunch of babies and leave you in a, in a year, you're not, you're going to hire a man instead. Women are socialized because of all this to have lower self-esteem and fear being assertive, particularly when they're seeking careers in things like math and physics. And just statistically, women, because of all this, women have lower incomes, we have higher rates of depression, and we're much, much more likely to get into abusive relationships. But irrational sexism also hurts men, <laughs> like the guys on Jackass. <laughs> How many times have they been hurt showing how manly they are? <laughs> and masculinity for men is a constant battle. Like, men are taught that they have to be strong and assertive and non-emotional. And that is just this constant, non-stop battle. Like, you, a very good writer, um, uh, Stephen Ducombe, basically put it really well on the wimp factor when he said, the problem with mas masculinity is it's like never a given. Like men never get to be like, I'm a real man, like just because I have a penis, even though that's technically true. <laughs> or, or you identify a gender, like I don't wanna, I don't wanna offend any trans men, I apologize for that. Um, but masculinity is a kind of constant battle for men. They feel like they always have to prove their manhood and often it leads to just completely ridiculous stuff like jackass, which I love. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> criticizing jackass. I'm glad that their masculinity issues have become entertainment for the rest of us. <laughs> Men's emotional stunting is encouraged. It gets, you know, men can often struggle creating friendships, relationships, because they're often afraid to, to go the next level of intimacy because that's treated as unmanly in our culture. Men die sooner. They're more likely to get shot. They're more likely to get killed on the job because of, because of a lot of these masculinity standards. And they get laid a lot less than I think they'd often like to <laughs> because women are socialized to be, a lot, be afraid of men and be afraid of, of being called a slut. And rational sexism hurts society. We lose out on half the human race's talents when we tell them that they're stupider, that they need to go home, that they are less worthy. They're going to take it to heart and they're going to probably not be, even the ones that work are probably not going to be reaching their full potential. But also, a lot of research is coming out that shows that when you invest in women as a society, it improves that society because women turn around and invest in their families. They do so even more than men. Um, so society does better. Children do better when women do better. And, and again, this is like the, UN, the United Nations and many other uh, NGOs go around the world and they've discovered when they're trying to invest in communities and, and, and developing parts of the world, and get the economic level of the community up, they do a lot better by giving women the opportunities, giving women the money, because women tend to invest it more. So we are, as a society, are losing out on women's ability to do better by their children, do better by their husbands, do better by their whole communities. And then there's sort of the philosophical idea, and I, I have this great quote by Simone de Beauvoir, all oppression creates a state of war. As long as there's inequalities in our society, there are tensions, there are cruelties, there's unnecessary violence. 
And I love Simone de Beauvoir, so I thought I'd wind up on a couple more of her quotes. Man is defined as a human being and a woman is female. Whenever she behaves as a human being, she's said to imitate the male. Which is, of course, the notion that feminism is the radical notion that women are people. <laughs> And this has always been a man's world, and none of the reasons that have been offered in explanation have seemed adequate. Simone de Beauvoir wrote that in the 1940s, I do believe, and I feel like, as I have demonstrated today, that it is still true, that all the explanations that are being offered for why this is a man's world are irrational. So thank you. <laughs> I hope I didn't run over time. <laughs> yeah. Sweet. Thank you. <laughs> wow. All right. If you were here last year, you know that I am the mic master. But I'm now a year older and a year wiser. So I think you all should come to me. And we're going to... Keep it nice, one question per person. So if you have any questions, I'm just gonna stand right here. Come on up, line up, and line. come to me, come to me, yes. All right. I'm gonna All take right. my jacket off because I am super okay. hot. You are the mic master, okay. As in temperature. Am I gonna, <laughs> <laughs> am I gonna suggest on anything else? <laughs> okay, um, my question is, what is your opinion on feminist theologians? Do you think that they actually do good for feminism, or do you think they're just a combination of dorks? Um, can I say both? Like, <laughs> I, I, I feel like they, they do good for feminism in the short term and women in their community, but I do feel that the long run, to, 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 for women to be equal in this world, we must all agree that God is dead, basically. <laughs> Hi, uh, I was wondering. Uh, I, I've heard about some studies that uh, that, that about um, um, the differences between men and women in terms of learning, in terms of like methods of learning, not not necessarily like the. Is there any credibility? I'm just wondering because uh, uh, I was watching some things and reading some things about how men and women learn different and. If, yeah. is, oh, is that is is that true or is it is it? I mean, I was um, just wondering. Leonard, about that. Leonard Sachs is the big proponent of that kind of learning theory, and he uses a great deal of of, of very bad bad science for his assertions, um, particularly the assertion that young men can't learn by sitting still and taking orders, but young women can, which implies that women are naturally more submissive than men. That, that is, like, if you think about it, it's kind of a silly theory because back when women were told that their uteruses pull too much blood from their brain, young men were expected to sit still and, listen, and take orders, and nobody ever quarreled with that. But I would definitely say, if you want to, like, a more thorough examination of that question, definitely read The Delusions of Gender. She has an entire chapter in there about how the theory that young men and young women are really different in their learning styles is complete bunk. Mike Master. I have the same cold you use, so pardon me. I went to a recent lecture on a similar topic, didn't get to ask this, I figured you're the perfect person to answer it. I won't get you sick, I promise. <laughs> if, do you feel like a lot of people um, are talking about that, you know, atheism has, has reached a pinnacle where it will continue to grow as religion continues to, to decrease. Do you feel that new wave feminism has reached a pinnacle where women's rights will continue to improve, or is there something that still needs to be done? In other words, this is the problem. What do you see as the cause, the solution to this? Um, I think that feminism and atheism are a little bit different because of the way that the organizing around it works. Like, I don't think that there is as much formal legal um, problems for atheists growing as there maybe are for feminists growing, whereas we're actually facing opposition that works through the courts and the law. Though I suppose that's a little unfair. Obviously, the opposition to atheists work through the courts and the law, but they think of themselves as more pro-Christian than anti-feminist. Um, my feeling is, yes, I do think over the long run people are going to be more feminist over time just because we're going to see the visible evidence that women are just as capable and smart as men. So just like atheism, it has sort of a compounding effect. Sarah Palin has claimed to be a feminist in the past. <laughs> <laughs> and, but, or, 
Is there any validity in that? Validity in that because in the same vein, she is uh, acquired to make um, attain power and give more empower women in that regard. But in the same vein, she's also anti-reproductive rights. So is she a feminist, or can she? Can you not call her that? I would say no. I think that her claiming the lame, name feminist in, and people think, taking that seriously is based on a fundamental misconception about what the word feminism means and feminist means. Feminism is the belief that men and, equal, and women are equal and they deserve equal rights, equal opportunities, and basically shared responsibilities. It doesn't mean women who just want power. <laughs> And, it doesn't, and, and simply being ambitious doesn't make you a feminist. Sarah Palin doesn't believe that women deserve equal rights. Sarah Palin cannot be a feminist. It's tautological, in my opinion. <laughs> All right, uh, we know a lot of examples of sexist polygamous societies, uh, but do you think there's a future for polyamory in an egalitarian context? Yeah, I would think. I, I mean, I don't see why not. <laughs> I think, um, I think that all of human history has been about controlling and oppressing, um, fem like controlling female sexuality and oppressing women. So what we can do if we finally get over that as a society is, is limitless. I recently read a, or heard a podcast regarding birth control pills and the early development of them, and they were saying that the month cycle was just an attempt to mimic nature in order to show that this is a natural thing. Yeah. And, and recently, I've heard of birth control pills that put women on three-month cycles, and I'm just curious what your thought is. And I'm surprised I haven't heard more about this because it seems to me like it would give you back your womb in a real sense, you know, have more control over your, your menstruation. Your period, yeah. yeah. Yes, actually, that's an interesting thing. It, 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 for those who don't know, one of the developers of the birth control pill was a devout Catholic. And he thought that the, if they built a, a pill that was on a monthly cycle that imitated, that gave a woman a period once a month, the Catholic Church would sign off on it. He failed to understand, because the argument for the, from the Catholic Church was that the rhythm, rhythm method is natural. And so he thought the pill is natural. What he failed to understand was that the Catholic Church just wanted to justify making women pregnant constantly. And whatever they needed to say to justify that. So the, the Catholic Church was against the pill immediately. <laughs> um, yes, um, I actually um, communicate with an, in, uh, an interesting blog to read about that is The Will Time Period. It's written by a gynecologist who um, teaches women how to use a birth control pill to completely control their periods if they want. If you want to start now, you can actually go to your gynecologist and ask for a, thir uh, a prescription there where you just skip every fourth week and they'll give you enough to cover the year for that, if your insurance will cover it. So um, it's, it's a little less safe, my doctor said, than, but not, not enough to, to justify like having to be on the, if you don't want periods, you don't have to have them. I think that's awesome. I think we should control nature as much as possible. <laughs> okay, this is going to be our last question. Sorry, everybody. I'm sorry. Oh my God. Um, I, I would just give a shout out for the Marina IUD, which also has the effect of uh, ending monthly menstruation. Um, uh, I just wanted to ask how the skeptic atheist community can deal with relationships in which People do follow, because of their personal choice, traditional gender roles um, and the problems that we face of thinking that a woman who's staying home with her children, you know, clearly must have had a lobotomy in order to do so, um, <laughs> even though that's, yeah. you know, Obviously patently not, true, not yeah. actually true. Yeah. Because I think that we, one of the problems that I've seen in feminism over the last 30 years is that if you are not doing something that was traditionally male, then your voice is devalued in our community? Wow, that, that's, a, that's a really deep question. I think that the answer, imperfect, it's an imperfect answer, but I do think that the main answer is to stop seeing feminism like Sarah Palin was defining it as like an individual thing, like I'm, I'm just a lady who's out there. Like, 
and as an, a, an analytical tool to understand gender and how it, it is in our society. Like, feminism should be about deconstructing gender, but we can't hold individuals responsible for filling certain gender roles when all of our social pressures are on that. And a, and a staying at home is a perfectly good example. A lot of the women don't necessarily want to give up their jobs or their, their financial independence, but childcare is really expensive. A lot of jobs suck. And those two things kind of come into conflation and becomes the best possible choice for you personally. Feminists need to look at a way to make those things that, that create dependence in women less good of a choice and make it easier for women to be financially independent. I don't think um, our business is judging women. Our business is making world, the world better for everybody. And part of that is, is deconstructing gender roles. Does that make sense? Yeah, cool. <laughs> Thank you so much. This has been really wonderful. You guys are the best. <laughs>